In the last four decades, marine life in our oceans have taken a very big hit. Even so, overfishing continues. 90% of fish like sharks, tuna, salmon, and countless others are being snatched from the ocean and put onto dinner plates far faster than they can reproduce. Scientists believe climate change and pollution have also jeopardized oceans, putting one of our most valuable natural resources at risk. But all hope isn't lost. The world's best-known oceanographer, Sylvia Earle, has dedicated her life to saving our oceans and goes above and beyond to educate and inspire the public. Well, I had a chance to sit down with Sylvia at the 2015 annual meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative to discuss her decades of underwater discoveries and how we can all help to protect, restore, and preserve our oceans for generations to come. Sylvia, first of all, it's such an honor to be speaking with you because you are truly a legend in your field of oceanography. Um, I know that in interviews you've talked about how this curiosity started, and it was way back when you were growing up in New Jersey as a child. So tell me about that moment in your life and why that led to what you do, what you do now. The people ask, how did I get to be an explorer? How did I get to be a scientist? And I say it's really easy. You start out as a child doing what children do, ask questions, who, what, why, where, when, how. They're irrepressible. It's just natural to many young things, but especially young humans. Never lose it. Whether you become a scientist or an explorer, I think everyone can have that as a core of observing carefully and reporting honestly what you see. And Everyone should be science savvy. Everyone should be an explorer, no matter what else you do with your life, because everyone can do it. It comes naturally. Somewhere along the line, we tend to smother it. Yeah. But yeah. A few that of natural us have... curiosity goes away as we get older sometimes. <laughs> but it's right? also a matter of wonder. Mm. Everything about the natural world is, everything about being alive, the fact that there is life, it's a miracle. Yeah. Yeah. And children sort of wake up with this sense of, wow, isn't this amazing? It's so true. Never lose that because it's still amazing. It, it continues to be. Let's talk about Mission Blue uh, because that's obviously a project that you started. Um, and it really is about trying to save the oceans and trying to save these, preserve these hope spots, as you call them. Tell me about what that is and what, what that's all about. Mission Blue is essentially a name for a movement, an idea to try to get people to know and care and do something positive about the natural world dominated by the ocean. Whether it is high in the mountains or deep in the sea, it all is one part, all part of, of the one glorious planet. It, it is our home, our life support system. We have a tendency to be very self-centered, as if we rule the world. Oh, yeah. well, we're finding that our extraction of the natural world to support our prosperity has costs that we're only now beginning to truly account for. We see it in the air that has changed, in the water that has changed, in the composition of the natural living systems that have been altered through our actions largely of course, throughout all of our history. But with our new technologies, the last 200 years, and I'd have to say mostly the last 50, mm. at an accelerating pace. As our numbers increase, it's not just a numbers game of more people. It's our power to alter, increasingly alter, the nature of nature. And if you like to breathe, You'll listen up. <laughs> and you've, you've said many times, no oceans, no us. That's right. I mean, that's how it's connected life. we are. It's the living ocean. It's not just rocks and right. water, sand and, and all the, the beautiful natural physical structures. It's the living ocean right. and the living land. It's photosynthesis. <laughs> you know, it's the ability of green things on the land and in the sea, right. mostly in the sea, that generate oxygen, take up carbon things that other creatures on Earth are oblivious to. As humans have the gift of knowing and of understanding what happens in a leaf, what happens in the water, 
that makes Earth a, a place that's suitable for us. I mean, we look at Mars and say, oh, beautiful red planet. Let's go live there. <laughs> but then you think about, hmm, what are we going to eat? What are we going to breathe? Right. Uh, how are we going to withstand the temperature ups and downs? We need a living planet. So protecting areas that are in great shape. The National Geographic calls these places pristine seas. Mm. And there are places that still remain. About half the coral reefs in the world are still in pretty good shape. Okay. The bad news is about half of them have been destroyed. When I came to the Caribbean as part of the Tektite mission in 1970, the reefs here were full of life. Today, those reefs are gone. We need to look at places around the coastal waters and in the high seas, everywhere, to say, we can restore the damage. We can't go back to what was, but we can make things better than they currently are. And there's plenty of evidence that, that works. When you stop killing things in a place, if we haven't destroyed all of their relatives all in the surrounding area, which we have a, been doing, there's a, there's a capacity to bring a better place into into focus. And that's your life's work. Uh, you know, I watched the Netflix documentary Mission Blue, Mission same Blue, name. Yes. Beautiful documentary, amazing story about your life. But there's a quote that you begin with, which really struck me. You're swimming with whale sharks, some of the most beautiful creatures oh, on the biggest planet. Whale, biggest, biggest fish in the ocean. In the ocean. I mean, it's like a greyhound bus <laughs> coming at it you, is. right? But you say they've been living here for millions of years. We're newcomers in their backyard. They're completely innocent of what humans do. That's right. And it's so true. You know, they're just living where they were meant to be. Right. And yet we're the changing <laughs> their home. Yes. But the thing is, we're also changing our home. Because we're sea creatures, too. I mean, it took me a while to get that through my head, but we need the ocean, a healthy, functioning ocean, every bit as much as a whale shark or a coral reef, or, or whatever it is that we think of as being in the ocean. We aren't in the ocean, but we need the ocean as the generator of the oxygen that we breathe, of this, the, this fabric of life that maintains the chemistry of the planet, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, things that humans have found words to describe the nature of what makes Earth a planet that is suitable for us. Right. And we now know that our lives depend on taking care of the natural systems that make Earth suitable for us in a, in a universe of unfriendly options. Yeah. We, we can dream of Mars, we can dream of setting up housekeeping somewhere else, but first we have to make peace with Earth. With our planet, yeah. right, right. Do you think we are, though, or do you think the awareness is growing? Are you seeing a sea change, for lack of a better phrase, yeah. that, that humans, that societies are finally getting that notion that we need to reverse this course? Plenty of reason for hope. I see it. It's partly because anyone can see it. Just look around. If you're 10 years old, you can remember when the world was different, better in some ways than it is now. Of course, we have benefited enormously from our investment in technology, our lives, our livelihoods. You know, generally speaking, people live longer and they live better. There is terrible poverty still, and there are diseases that plague humankind and wars. There are lots of things that are negative, but if you look overall of where hum humanity was a hundred years ago versus where humanity is today, we've come from two billion to creeping up on eight billion. And generally speaking, our level of quality of life is better, but there's a cost. And now we are beginning to account for that cost. Are we grasping the notion that we can't just keep taking I hope you know, so. As people, because we just can't there are limits. keep taking. That's it. It's quality over quantity. That we can't cram an infinite number of people 
into a planet of finite size, knowing that there's a cost to our prosperity, to every individual, food, water, space, all of it. But we can take what we have and do a much better job armed with the technologies that we now have than we could a hundred years, or let alone a thousand years ago. We understand the value of nature. Eating wild fish is not going to be an option for much longer because it's wildlife. Uh, we don't consume that many songbirds and eagles and owls from a, or wild creatures to sustain seven billion people. A tiny fraction actually gain sustenance, necessity from wildlife. Most of what feeds us, we have, we have learned over 10,000 years how to efficiently harness sunlight's energy through plants to a small number of grazing animals, chickens, ducks, geese, cows, pigs, out of the thousands of birds, and thousands of mammals, and a handful of freshwater fish, we are actually feeding most of the world, mostly with plants, mostly. Most of the calories still come from where they should come from, the most efficient sunlight plants. Eat the plants. Or if we're going to eat animals, grow the animals efficiently. And we're getting better at doing that. And it, it isn't just the big agricultural giants. It's looking at communities, how most effectively and directly communities, families, can sustain a large portion of what they need. And that must give you hope that you see yes. people becoming more aware, you see people yes. caring more about yes. the environment, about the ocean. And it's a health issue, too. And yeah. health, yeah, health issues, too, because, again, you know, we're, we're limited, we have limited resources on this planet. Are there things that still break your heart, though? Because I, I'll admit, I look around and there's a lot of things about the environment that breaks my heart. One of them is uh, shark fishing, sure. um, shark fin. Crazy. And, you know, China is a very big, big culprit of that. Um, this is this is nothing to do with need, nothing at all. Right. This is not about sustenance. It's about luxury. That's right. It's about an attitude. It's about being. Yeah. It's about marketing. We've been sold the idea that it's an honor to be given something rare. Well, shark fin soup is no longer rare, but sharks are becoming rare, mm -hmm. and ultimately they'll be gone if we continue doing what we're doing. So it's just this artificially induced taste. And it's not anything about real taste. It's right. about the, you know, the social It's the feeling. idea. Yeah, the idea. Yeah. Uh, the same thing has been true in the past with birds. Feathers to adorn your, your hats or furs, not because you need to stay warm, but because it's the, you know, the she-she thing to do, right. to wear an animal skin. Right. This sounds really primitive when you think about it. Yeah. Dead animals adorning your body. Well, it's, it's an attitude. So we need to do a much better job of speaking for nature, marketing, why the, keeping thing, that a live fish is more beautiful than a dead fish, and more, more important too. And the, in the wild. In the wild, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's okay for people to have pets and to have aquaria as you know, pet fish, if you will. But again, extracting from the wild can be a dangerous thing. You can deplete areas. But growing fish, the way we grow our pets, cats and dogs and horses, there's a place for this because as humans, it's a part of our psyche to love and give love to a cat or a dog or, yeah. of course, to other humans. But the affection that we we bestow on cats, for example, the wild cats are being destroyed. Yeah. It's the an irony, isn't it? Elephants are being destroyed yeah. because of the, we value not the living animal, but something that is their, their fate. They, they have these wonderful big tusks, and again, it's a luxury, not a need. We should honor and respect these creatures for their own sake and honor them Sylvia, thank you so much for your time. Again, an honor to speak with you. Thank I you. Really See you underwater. It.